Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 17 through 14 today um, during this time of, uh, of uh, shelter in place and some time. I, I, went, I started a series uh, about four weeks ago. Um, I, was, I hope well, I'm going to say this. I, I was called One Ultimate Focus, and I wanted to really focus uh, for myself and my life in our lives, what, what is our focus in our life? And so Paul had a focus uh, after he was saved on the road to Damascus. He, he gives a testimony in Philippians chapter 3, the first part of it, and we pick it up in verse 7. So in verse 7, Paul writes to the Philippian church. He says this, But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I might attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that we have made it, I do not consider I have made it my own, but one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we pray today that we would experience the power of your resurrection that for Paul, his purpose, his focus every single day of his life was to experience that power. Father, I may that power be ours today as we look to your word. And Father, may you bless it, may you strengthen us with it as you promised to do. Thank you for allowing us and the freedom to read it and to declare it as true. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. I want you to imagine this morning that you're involved in a play, or a theatrical production, in fact, uh, at a local community theater. That theater is putting on My Fair Lady. I don't know if you remember that story. Uh, Maybe you're uh, Henry Higgins, or you remember Liza Doolittle. Well, basically, uh, Henry was supposed to teach her the proper way to speak English and take her from a mere flower girl to one of the aristocratic elites of the society and had made a, probably a bet with that. And, and tonight is a dress rehearsal that you're going to go through every single thing that story has to deal with. And uh, you know what a dress rehearsal is, don't you? It's, it's when you perform it with no one in the audience and when the director or the conductor uh, make sure that everybody knows what's going on so that when you do it live, you don't have to make mistakes. You, you, you've, you've made mistakes before and you've been able to solve them or iron them out. But right before the curtain goes up in this dress rehearsal, the producer approaches you and says, tonight we have a special guest. It's a talent agent that has flown all the way in from New York City to watch your performance. And he's considering you for this very, very part on Broadway. Now this changes the dynamic, doesn't it? It goes from being just a mere dress rehearsal to now it may become the performance of your entire career. How well you did tonight will determine much of your future, maybe. Suddenly you're profoundly aware of the significance of the next two hours. And of course you give it all you got. 
Next, let's, let's imagine something a little bit different. I want you to imagine in your mind something just a little bit different. Not just a theatrical production, but I want you to imagine your life. Let's imagine we're talking about your entire life. And where you're performing today has the potential to take you tomorrow. What you're doing today has the potential to do something for you tomorrow. This, in fact, is the way it really is because life is made of, what, little decisions, aren't they? They're made of very little decisions, and those decisions affect tomorrow, don't they? And everything we do affects tomorrow and then tomorrow tomorrow. But what we do today is what really matters. You see, one lesson we learned throughout Scripture and we have focused on throughout this series is this, that today is not a mere dress rehearsal. What we're experiencing today and what we're doing today counts. Every day is not a dry run. It's the real thing. And so we have a tendency to live sometimes if today doesn't count. That's what we do. So oh, we, well, we'll throw away today, and today doesn't really count, so I'm not going to do the things I know I should do or the things I know I should do in relating to God or relating to people or loving people. Today doesn't really matter to me. Well, as you see on the slide, today matters. You see, today matters, and as long as we call it today, it matters more than any other single day of your entire life. You may have had a lot of things happen to you that are very important to you. But let me tell you, today is the most important day of your life. It starts out with everything. You might want to change something today. Well, today matters. And today we're wrapping up a series entitled One Unarguable Focus. Now, I wish, I wish I would have called it Getting Focused, but I didn't. So we'll, we'll stick with that. But we, we want to get focused with our life, especially going through what we've gone through the last two months. It, it, had, it had the ability to unfocus us, to, to make us become too relaxed or may, maybe become too, what I would say, uh, coasting in life. And so what I want to do is kind of as we conclude this series to think about how do we get back on the track of considering every single day as the most important day of our life. Because it is. And see, what we did was we, we wanted to do that. We wanted to talk about intentional living. I wanted to talk about that because life can become very blurry during times of difficulty. You see those books up there? You probably can't read. You might be able to read maybe one of the titles. But they're very hard to read, right? Your eyes are not going bad. Don't worry. Okay? Though, though, that picture is blurry for a purpose. Because that's how sometimes we feel about what's happening in our lives. That's how we feel sometimes about what's going on in our life. When we just coast through life, life becomes more of a blur. It becomes unclear. It becomes fuzzy. But when you know the priorities of your life and what matters, and you commit to doing what matters in your life every single day, the essential elements become very clear. Just like that. When you know what God wants you to do, when you know God's plan, when you know his purpose, when you know how he wants you to relate to people, things become a lot clearer than when we are just coasting through life. And so today matters. You see, in week one, we talked about a one Lord lifestyle. We said, Jesus said, we said, Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon or you can't serve two different masters. Only one has the right to be Lord of all, and that's namely Jesus Christ. He is Lord. He's our Savior. He's our King. In week two, we talked about um, identifying our purpose. Now, if you look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, it says this. Now, let me, let me just skip down to verse 2. If you could go down to verse 2, it says, Looking to Jesus, I want you to say that, the founder and perfecter of our faith. He was talking about what happened on the cross when he died because his motivation was for the joy that was set before him, wasn't it? But Paul says that what we do is we look to Jesus. We need to fix our eyes and gaze upon Jesus as Lord. 
And in week two, we saw, and as the purpose that he has for our life. We talked about that God may have called you to do something that is a little bit beyond your reach, that you should continue to reach for it because he, if, if you're going to reach for it, he will fulfill those things that are part of his will that you're reaching for. That's so important. We're going to talk a little bit more about that today. Week three, we talked about last week, we talked about one essential love. We talked about how important it was to reflect love for other people because as we reflect love for people, it reflects our love for God, doesn't it? And today we're going to bring the series to a finish line. We're going to talk about an idea of making the most of every single day of your life. One Lord, one purpose, one love, and one day. That's what I was trying to get across in fixing our lives. Now, you may have seen this picture here. It's the picture of, um, keep going through that, the next one. This is a picture. You remember the movie, The Dead Poet Society? Anybody remember that? The Dead Poet Society was about basically a, a literature pro professor in an elite prep school in the 50s that resurrected a Latin phrase. And that Latin phrase Guess what it was? Carpe diem, right? You know what it means? Seize the day. Right, exactly right. We need to seize the day. We need to grab it, get a hold of it, give it all you got. Because every day is the Lord's day, isn't it? Really, truly. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will do what? Rejoice and be glad in it. Regardless of what we go through, we should be glad that the Lord has given us today. You see, we only have one life to live, and Hebrews says this in Hebrews 9, verse 27. He says, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. In other words, he says, this is not a dress rehearsal. The life we're living now is not something that we get to come back at another life and do it over again. There are people that believe that. We believe that there is one life to live and what you do in this life will have effects for all eternity. In fact, it, when, when, we get, when we end this life, we will come before the judgment seat of God. Every one of us will be judged for our works, I believe. Whether the works are works of faith or works of self-righteousness. You see, Paul... The apostle who wrote to the church at Ephesus, to church at Philippians or Philippi, had every reason to boast about his life. I mean, if there was anybody he said could boast about anything, he, he would say, Look, look, I, I'm one that could boast about all that I've done. I'm, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, he would say. He said, If anyone thinks he has, in verse 4, he says, If anyone thinks, he has reason for confidence in the flesh. I have more. In other words, man, I am spiritual to the max if I look at my works. But all those works, we're going to find out, were of no use. Because God does not allow you to work your way up to him. We don't earn anything from our works, do we? Now, when we're judged based upon our works, we're judged whether those works are the result of faith or not. God will test our works to see if we have faith. Because faith is the way that we are saved, isn't it? So we will stand, everybody, before the judgment seat of God. We will be judged because there is only one life to live and what today you do matters. That's why the psalmist said this. He said, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of what? Wisdom. We need to get a heart of wisdom. In other words, being able to do what is right, not just know what is right. See, a lot of people know the right thing to do, but they don't do it, right? You may say, you may say well, yeah, kids do that. They may know what to do. I told them what to do, but they don't do it. But adults do the same thing, don't we? Many times we know the right thing to do, but we just don't, excuse me, we just don't do it. We just don't do it. This phrase, a number of our days are right, has a two-sided meaning. One means, one would be to say we understand that life has brevity in it, but it also means that we should plan our days accordingly with some sense of urgency. We have one life to live, and in order to live your life to be all that it can be, you need to learn to live it to its fullest. That's carpe diem. That's seizing 
the day. And it's what intentional living, it's what getting focused is all about. It's seizing opportunities. So today I want to talk to you about making the most of every single day mentality. The most of this day mentality. Because this is the only day you have right now. You don't have tomorrow. Yesterday is gone. Today is the day you need to make the most of it. And so I'm going to give you three resolutions today. Three resolutions that you can make in your heart of hearts that will help you seize this day for the Lord. Number one, I want you today to make it your daily habit, resolve to make it your daily habit to put the past behind you. We've talked about this more more times in this series. In fact, in the One Lord Lifestyle, we talked about it uh, quite a bit because we, we tend to dwell on the past, don't we? You and I tend to dwell on the past. You know, you know we, we look at the past, we can look at the past positively or we can look at the past negatively, but we tend to dwell on the past, particularly if our past was bad. We have a hard time of letting, letting go of the mistakes we've made or the sins we've committed or the hurtful things we've experienced at the, at the hands of others. It's hard to let go, I would say, of a difficult past. We keep asking ourselves, why did I have to do that? Or... Why did that have to happen to me? Or why couldn't it have been just a little different? Or a hurtful past brings up brokenness and shame and regret. It takes away of our ability to focus on today. Or sometimes we cling to the past because it was good. Oh, we remember good things, and the past was so much better than what we're experiencing today. We, we could say to ourselves, back then I had money. You know, back then, I didn't have the troubles I had today. You know, we could say back then, there, were, there was no thing about a pandemic, was there? We, didn't, we weren't really worrying about things of that nature. But today, we have different issues. We have different problems. We have, we have more, we think, problems than we did ever before. That's why Paul says in verse 7, he said this. He, he had just given his testimony that he was the Hebrew of Hebrews, and if anybody could trust himself, it was Paul. But he said this, but whatever I had gained, I counted as loss for Christ's sake. Indeed, I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. And so Paul was, was very much not going to let the past hinder his seizing the day. He counted all that as loss, all, that, all the good things that he had done, all the things that would give him, what I say, a credibility in the eyes of people, in the eyes of spiritual people or the Pharisees of the day, he would count them as loss because he realized that they amounted nothing to God. All his works, all his good deeds, all his striving in the sense that were works Merited nothing before the Almighty God. And so to, he said that count him as loss. He really is dung, as garbage, as refuge. And so what I'm saying to you is think about this. Resolve in your heart not to trust your past. Good or bad. If it's bad, throw it away. Because God, God's going to start something new today, isn't he? When Jesus died upon that cross, the question is, has he redeemed your past? And the answer is absolutely what? Yes. He's done that for you. Think about that. He's done it. It's it's it now you may have to bring it, you may have to fight this over and over again. And especially some of you that have a great past. You kind of wish you could go back to those days because they were easier or better or whatever we think they are. But let me tell you, your best day is today. The day that you can rejoice in today is today. You can have more joy today by knowing Jesus Christ because of what he did and knowing the God by what Jesus Christ did on that cross because, guess what, today he's with you. So once again, we need to look at today. There's a story back on 1929 Uh, Many of you like football, don't you? Now, no one's playing any sports today, but in 1929, they played a game, and uh, Georgia Tech was playing in the Rose Bowl against California. 
Late in the second quarter, a man by the name of Roy, and I'm going to pronounce it Riggles, uh, recovered a fumble uh, for California. And in his excitement, he got confused. And you know what he did? He ran in the wrong direction. Can, can you imagine that? Just think about that. He, he, he recovered a fumble, started running in the wrong direction, and he, he was probably wondering, why is anybody trying to tackle me? You know, and the other team was going, go, go, no, whatever. One of his teammates caught him and tackled him at the two-yard line. Well, this is right before the halftime, and I guess they had to give up the ball, and eventually before half, Georgia Tech scored. You see, his, 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 I guess, running the wrong way put him 98 yards from a touchdown for them. And it was a serious mistake. In the locker room at halftime, Roy sat in the corner by himself crying. The rest of the room was completely silent. The coach didn't make his usual speech at all. Didn't say a word. Right before they were supposed to go back on the field, the coach said these words. He said, Starting team will go back on the field to begin the second half. Team got up, got excited, went back on the field except for Roy. He remained in the corner and told the coach, I can't do it, coach. I can't play. I've ruined the team. The coach said, get up, Roy. The game is only half over. You belong on the field. And guess what? No matter what we've done in our life, no matter what we're going to do, the game isn't over, is it? I don't care how much regret you have for your past, and I don't care how much, uh, how much longing you have for the past. The game isn't over. We've got to get back out on the field, not only as a church, but as individuals, don't we? We need to be able to get on the field and be able to do the things that God has commanded and desires us to do. Regardless of your past, you still have the rest of the game to play. And this leads me directly into the second resolve I want you to say. Not only do you need to put the past behind you, but you need to resolve to make it your daily habit to keep running on the road before you. You need to make it, I'm not going to stop running. I'm not going to stop doing things just because I've hit a snag or hit something, a problem. What's the road before you? It's the second half of your life. It's the rest of your life. You know, for Regals, it was his, what? The second half of the game, but it may, be, it, may be, it may be the next job. It may be the next sales call. It may be the next assignment you have. It may be the next try. It's easy to give up. It's easy to get depressed and give up. But you know what? Even if all your life has been running, spent running in the wrong way, and you find yourself now tackled at the two-yard line, 98 yards from where you ought to be, you leave the locker room of life today because the game isn't over. Paul understood that he, he couldn't take the road before him if he kept looking over his shoulder. He said in verse 13, look at verse 13 of our text. He says, brothers, I do not consider what I have made, I do not consider that I have made it my own. In other words, the, the, the experience that he was saying about the resurrection of the dead, about experiencing Christ's sufferings and all the things that he wanted and being related to. But he says, one, things I, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. This means that each day we need to ask ourselves, what can I do to make the most of today? Paul said, listen, I press, I press. In other words, I put pressure, I, I, I put effort into something. And the thing that he put effort in is to live for the goal of the call of God upon our lives, didn't he? Isn't that what he said? See, week one, we talked about paving a path for your heart to follow. And so we needed to ask ourselves, what can I do today to move closer to Christ? Your call, and God has called each one of you to grow closer to Christ, period. Hadn't he? He wants you to grow closer to him. 
One person said this week to me, if, if someone gave you a piece of property and a tractor and seeds and all the utensils to farm, what do you do? You have to put what? Some effort into it, right? You can't just say, well, I got the tractor, I'll just watch the tractor work. No, that's not what he says. He said, we need to be able to seize the opportunity to make the most of today. We talked about being a, a one purpose, purpose person, about having that one purpose. And you need to ask yourself each and every day, what, what can I contribute to the purpose of God that is called in my life to bring him glory? We talked about living a life of love, and we wanted to talk about how to, how to keep our eyes open so we can see what God wants us to do for other people. All of those things are important, but we do this on a daily basis. You take the road before you, you press on, you make, it, you make this day look like every, like every other day ought to look. You need to focus on Jesus, pursue your purpose, and love others. That's what God wants you to do. That's what every single day should be about, should be about. Now, I want you to look at verse 9 real quickly. Verse 9 says this. He says, all those things in the past are, he says in verse 8, are rubbish, are rubbish. In other words, they're dung, they're refuge, they're, they're what goes down the toilet, okay? That's what he says. And then he says this, he says in verse 10, he says, that I may know him, or verse 9 says, verse 9 actually says, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. In other words, you don't relate to God by having right deeds by law keeping. In other words, if, if your parents tell you to do something and you do it, you might get rewarded. God says he doesn't reward that way with a relation with God. It is purely by God's grace. When Jesus died upon that cross, he was doing it for you because you could not pull yourself up into a relationship with God on your own. You couldn't do it. In fact, nothing you did worked. And only Jesus Christ was able to bridge the gap, to bridge that bridge over between you and God. And in verse 10, he talks about that a little bit more. He says, that I might know him, so I have a righteousness that didn't come from works, but from faith, that I might know the power of the resurrection. Every single day you live is an opportunity to know the power of the resurrection. Every single day is to know the power and the joy comes from being satisfied wholly by God. You will never know any other power joyfully or anything else joyfully or satisfactorily unless you know God through Christ because Christ is your satisfaction. You know, we, people love money, don't they, in our, in our culture today. We love money. We love things. But you know what? they eventually do not give us what we want. Because our hearts, we were made, see, you and I were made not to stuff our life with things, but we were made to know in our heart of hearts God. And because of our sin, we have told God, no, thank you. But even though we were sinners, even though we said no, thank you to God, God still made a way, didn't he? He still came, he still died upon that cross. And the third resolution I want you to understand here is make it your daily habit to reach what is beyond you. Keep on that road, don't, give up, don't get off that road that you're on walking with God. Forget your past and then reach out to what God really wants you to do. Paul says again in verse 14, he says, I press on, then he says, to what? Towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know what? Paul did things that he probably didn't think he could do. He went on missionary journeys. He started churches. He, 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 he developed leaders. He solved problems. He dealt with conflict. I'm sure that Paul, in, 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 in his mind, never thought that God can use him that way. But God had a plan for him, just like he has a plan for you and me, and a call upon your life as well. 
He says in verse 12 of Philippians 3, he says the same thing. He makes it plain. He says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. In other words, I haven't arrived. I, I'm still on this road. I'm still reaching ahead. But he says, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Although the greatest joy you'll ever have is knowing the Lord, isn't it? Is knowing and being involved. Remember when you first met the Lord? It was exciting. You were, uh, I was like a, a rifle. I wanted to shoot everybody I found with, with the gospel. I mean, I wanted everybody to know the experience that I had in Christ. I wanted everybody to know that. I wanted everybody to experience what I was experiencing. And Paul says, even though we might have bad days, we press on, we, we keep reaching. And what he's saying is that there's a future out there. And there's a future out there that we can do things that we don't think we can do with God's power and strength and ability. That goes for each one of us. We can serve in ways that we don't think we can serve yet. And two, the church, this church can do things we don't think we can do. You see, where, wherever God is calling you, he's calling you to stretch. That's what Paul says. He's, that upward call. Upward call. It's a call to do things that God has planned, not just your planning. It's an upward call to stretch. And he says it again in verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Straining what? Backwards? No, he says what? Forwards to what lies ahead. King James says, what? Straining forward, ESV says, no, King James says, reaching forth. We need to reach for things that God would have us do. Maybe, maybe things that we don't think we can do. Things we don't think we can do as a church, things we don't think we can do as individuals, but we keep on reaching. It may be seem impossible that a marriage could ever get back on an even keel, but you keep reaching for a better relationship. It may, be, it may seem impossible that a business plan that you have could ever work or this degree could ever be attained, but you, you keep reaching for that success. It may seem impossible to ever overcome a particular sin in your life, but you do not give up. You do not give up. On this Memorial Day, people have given their lives for the cost of our freedom, our religious freedom. We do have religious freedom. Even in pandemics, we have religious freedom. We have freedom to do. The government doesn't dictate how we worship the Lord, does it? We have religious freedom in our society. We have religious freedom because people have given their lives for that very purpose. Now, when a soldier goes out to battle, what does he say in the morning? Does he say, man, I hope I only get shot five times? Is that what a soldier says? A soldier says what? He goes to the day going, my goal is to get what? Shot zero times, right? We don't want to get hit at all. We go into a battle every single day against Satan, the flesh, and the devil. I mean, the flesh and the devil. Uh, and and we, we go into battle all the time. Don't lower your standard from God's standards. Saying, oh, I'll accept this standard because I just, I just can't live up to another standard. Find out what God's standard is and live for that. Press on, press forward, reach out, reach forward. Seize what? The day. Because it means you need to reach again and again for something that is above your capacity to reach for, beyond your grasp. That's what God wants us to do. You'll see a picture of a man and I'm going to pronounce his name probably incorrectly. His name is um, Dashraf Manji. He was a common laborer in the hills of Bihar, India. His community was somewhat remote with limited access to, virtual, to vital services because traveling to get those needs or those supplies was... Um, was a problem because there was a mountain between them. 
And in that mountain, it, invited, it was a several day journey just to go there and back. But you know what he did? He decided that the best thing was to do not to go around the mountain, but to go through the mountain. And since no one was willing to help him, he decided that he would start the process. Well, if you see in this next picture, he sold some goats to buy a hammer and chisel. And he set out chipping away the mountain each day after work. Of course, people said, you know, he was crazy. And the project would never be completed. But he just kept chipping away. Chip, 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 chip. 1960. Chipping away, 1961 to 1962. Every day after work, just chipping away at the mountain. Then, uh, fast forward if you wanted to, 1980, chipping away, 1981, chipping away. You know what? 1982, his project was completed. That's the picture of what he did in those years. But you know when it started? It started today. And every single day after that, he never got off the road. He reached for something that was beyond him. To me, that's an, exa- that's an amazing example, isn't it, of what we're seeing. You can make the most of each and every day. You can really carve a road through a 300-foot impasse, a mountain with just a hammer and chisel and yourself. It's possible with God. In 22 years, it took him to do it. If you want your life to become what it can be, you need to make a daily resolve to aim for that which is beyond you and keep reaching for it, that which is above you, each and every day. We can't afford to go through life as a dress rehearsal. This is not a dress rehearsal. What we do in church is not a dress rehearsal. Every time we come and gather together, this is vital and serious stuff when we come before God. Because each of us will give an account before God. We will do that. Even us as believers, we will have faith on our side. Our works will be shown to be faithful so that our works will be an evidence of our faith in Christ. But we will still be judged by God. And God will judge us. He will reward us for certain things at his beam of seat. But he will also judge us at that great white throne about our works. So we can't just go through the motions. We can't go through the motions as Christianity. You can't just come to church and think you're a Christian, can you? See, Christianity is not just about religion. It's not just about doing the right thing. It's about believing and trusting in the king who died for our sins, didn't he? He made a payment for me that I could not pay. All of us have that. Today matters, as the slide says. Today matters, as long as it's called today, it matters more than any other day of your life. So let's seize it. Let's seize today. Let's do it by putting the past behind you, by staying on that road that God has for you and reaching for things that are beyond your ability which is the high calling of Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's do that together. Let's do it and encourage each other to do that. Let's make it our focus to reach beyond all that we could ever ask or think because then we'll find God in that process. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for all that you have done for us. I thank you for all that you have given to us. And I pray today that as we are here, I pray that you would help us today 